Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Active Church. We're so glad to see you this morning. Let's stand together as we begin to worship. If you're watching online, thanks so much for joining us. We're excited to have you with us. We're going to put our hands together like this. Come on, church, from the front to the back. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Your way is the only one. It's a narrow road that leads to life, but I want to be on it. It's a narrow road, but the mercy is wide. Cause you're good on your promise. Come on, sing this. I'll take you at your word. If you said it, I believe it. I've seen how good it works. If you started, you completed. I'll take you at your word. Come on. Chaos fell in life. I know because I've seen it in my life. It's a narrow road that leads to life, but I want to be on it. It's a narrow road, but the tide is high. As you parted the water, sing it out. I'll take you at your word. If you said it, I'll believe it. I've seen how good it works. If you start it, you'll complete it. Say, I'll take you at your word. If you said it, I'll believe it. I've seen how good it works. If you start You're good on your promise. Yeah, yeah. You're good on your promise. All right, we're going to sing this part. You said your love. You said your love. Never give up. You said your grace is always enough. You said your heart would never forget or forsake me. You say I'm saved. You said I'm saved, you call me yours, you said my future's full of your hope, you never fail, so I know that you'll never fail me. Sing it one more time, come on. You said your love will never give up, you said your grace is always enough, you said your
keep it going this morning. Keep those hands together. Come on, help us out, church. Church, we're going to keep singing in just a moment, but before we do, uh, we're going to enter into a time of communion, uh, and it's, it's special that here at Active we get to do this every week. Not, not too many places get the opportunity to, to have a time of communion every single week at every service, and that's, that's just because we, we believe here that we forget a lot about the importance of what Christ has done 
on the cross. We forget often throughout our busy week the body that was broken and the blood that was spilled for us. So this is just a time for you to, to remember, a time for you to think, a time to be alone with your, with your thoughts, really. So we have elements off to the side as well as to the back. So you can feel free now to go grab those, and once you come back, we'll keep singing. could sing these songs as I often do every song God Church, sing, sing, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get down, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get down, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion in Side of those songs, get up and praise the Lord. I want to hear you say, so Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. It's a your song. Cause you've got a lion. Say, So get up and praise the Lord. Yeah. So come on, my soul. 
to sing. So I throw on my head and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is love. Hey, good morning, Active Church. My name is Mike. I serve as the lead pastor here at Active, and I'm so glad that you're here, whether you're in the room or you're watching online. Thanks for being a part of the story that God is writing at Active Church. I want to invite you into something today that can help build the future of Active. Each and every week, we talk about how important it is to worship God through our generosity, through our giving of our tithe and our offering. And you can participate in this with us today. You see the ways to give on the screen. You can give online at activechurches.com. You can text the amount to the number on the screen. If you're in the room today, you can drop off cash or check in the boxes on the walls or in the lobby. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you to those that give regularly. Thank you for those that actually plan to give. I wanna say thank you to those that started giving. Since we've shared the five-year vision last October, you have stepped up and you have joined the charge, joined the mission of Active Church to help support it financially. And for those of you that are considering giving, maybe you haven't started your giving journey yet, I wanna invite you to the table today because your resources change the world. And I wanna explain how you can change this community and this world that we're living in right now. In 2023, we have four big initiatives that we want to achieve. And as we come to the end of 2022, I wanna invite you to consider giving and maybe giving over and above what you regularly give. These four initiatives will help us on this campus, but will also help us in this community and help us to reach our hands across the globe. We wanna renovate our patio space out in the middle of our campus for families. And we wanna use it to connect. We wanna use it to celebrate our kids. We wanna cover it so that when it's really hot, we can be out there and we wanna cover it so that when it rains, we can be out there as well. The second thing we wanna do is we wanna renew our kids' playground. We wanna put that like soft, cushy kind of ground, right? So that when kids fall, they can get right back up. It's not concrete, it's not hard. And we wanna renovate that in the playground area. The third thing that we want to do is we want to, we believe at Active Church, the next lead pastor is a part of the church right now, and we want to invest in them. We want to help them to be prepared for what God has placed in their hearts so that they are ready to lead in a significant way. And then the fourth thing we want to do is we want to invest in those that are having to escape really horrible situations in other countries, in particular in Russia and in the Ukraine. There are families that are escaping that war and they're coming to the United States. And we have two great friends, two great pastors, Heather and Jenya Shulgin, that are leading the way, helping them to find places to stay, helping to furnish homes so that they can actually live in freedom and live with some hope. And we wanna help fund that. We're believing that as a church, we can begin to raise $200,000 to help these four initiatives, the playground, the patio, helping invest in the next pastors and also in the refugees. And I wanna invite you to the table today to consider giving, not just giving a tithe, but considering as the end of the year comes, how you can give above and beyond that. Maybe you're a business owner and you can give above and beyond. You need a tax write-off, you can give above and beyond. Maybe you haven't given at all and now's your opportunity to give. These are things that we wanna achieve in 2023. And at the end of this year, as we think about God's gift to us through Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to the table to think about how you can give a gift to help others tell better stories, to help others meet Jesus and learn to follow Jesus. Listen, our commitment to you is that every resource that we collect at Active will be used to honor God and tell better stories in our community. And this isn't something that you're doing on your own, but the people around you, the people watching online with you, they're doing it with you. The, the staff and the elders at Active Church, we're doing it with you. We're all in this together. So today, I wanna to invite you to give. 
The three ways are on the screen. But I also want you to prayerfully consider how you can help us to move into the next season, the next year, with great financial momentum that we can invest in those that are the next leaders. We can invest in the next generation. We can invest in those kids. We can invest in those that need hope, not just locally, but globally. Active, I love you. There's nothing like this. Look around you today. There is nothing like the story that God is telling here at Active Church. And I'm so glad that you're a part of it today. I love you. I miss you. And I'll see you soon. today starting off with our Christmas kickoff kickoff we're gonna football like football but we're gonna do it big right Christmas I think we're pretty famous for our Christmas kickoff we have a tree lighting we do some cookie decorations we have uh, families uh, families we have activities for the whole family to enjoy that's gonna be on December the 4th 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. right here on campus we're gonna sing some Christmas carols we're gonna go big we're gonna kick it off pretty big um, always dude I know that it's not Christmas time yet. We still got Thanksgiving, right? Casey, what's your go-to Christmas or your go-to Thanksgiving meal? Like, what's the one thing, the essential, that you need for Thanksgiving? The essential for Thanksgiving, you can punt the turkey and kick out the ham. Because all I need is a big old honking plate of mashed potatoes, right? <laughs> but here's the key. It needs a river of butter just flowing through it. Okay. And then it, it meets right at the base with the river of gravy coming down as well. Big old honk and play. It's gotta be, it's gotta come together like, like a that. Mountain, a Mount it's like Everest. angels sing when that happens. It's delicious. <laughs> nice. that's, a, that's a little weird, but okay, cool. I'll take that. <laughs> mashed potatoes. I, lo- I think too much about mashed potatoes, to be honest with you. Um, but Christmas kickoff is gonna be amazing. It's gonna kick off our Christmas season here at Active and hopefully the Christmas season for your family because after that, we're gonna have Christmas Eve here on campus at Active Churches. We have three amazing services, 2 p.m., 4 p.m., and 6 p.m. They're all even numbers, so they're easy for us to remember. But it's gonna be an amazing time. It's a perfect opportunity for you to invite a loved one, for you to invite your doctor or dentist, your barista, a friend, a neighbor, whoever, because Christmas Eve is going to be better with a friend, and we cannot wait to meet them. We cannot wait to see them, and there's no better thing to see on a Christmas season than a friend or a neighbor coming to know Jesus this Christmas season. So we cannot wait. So make sure you guys are there. December 24th, it's a Saturday. It's happening at 2 p.m., 4 p.m., and 6 p.m. right in this room. Yeah, there is joy. That's our theme this year. There is joy. There's even more joy when you bring a friend. Definitely agree with that. Um, Also, we have Baptism Sunday. That's going to be happening December the 27th, right here on campus at both services. We love to celebrate life change here. December 4th, I'm sorry. (laughs) December 4th. We love to celebrate life change so much. I like to announce it so much. We're going to be celebrating life change, um, our family members, our friends, people in our community, people in our connect groups. um, They're taking that next step in their faith journey, making a public declaration that, you know what, I'm all in for this. I'm following Jesus. I'm doing it with my friends and my family, and we want to celebrate them big. So make sure you show up and show out um, for Baptism Sunday, December the 4th at both services. If you would like to sign up for baptism, you can visit us at Guest Central, or you can stop any one of our team members and we get you plugged in. That's right. And maybe if you have a young kid that's looking to be baptized, but you're not sure yourself if they're ready for it, that's okay. We have a perfect alternative for you until they're ready. We have child dedications happening next Sunday, the 27th, and it's going to be uh, during our first service. So if you would like to dedicate your child on that Sunday, it's a great way to say, hey, I'm committed to raising my child and our family into the love of Jesus. And I would love, uh, and the church is here to to help support that and pray for you and, and cheer you along on the way as well. So if you're interested in child dedications, you can sign up at Guest Central, or you can head to the kids' uh, check-in area, and we have a way for you to sign up there as well. And 
Speaking of Guest Central, if you're new or you're, this is your first few weeks here at Active and you're still checking us out, we would love to meet you. We would love to see your face. We would love to get to know you and get to know your name. So come meet us at Guest Central. We have a free gift for you. If you're watching online and you're new to Active as well, we would love to connect with you and give you a free gift. So you could text the number that is on the screen and we would connect with you. Or you can uh, just say, I'm new in the comment section and we will love to see how we can pray for you and be there for you. So thank you guys so much for being here. We're going to hear an awesome message from Pastor Joe today. So go ahead and turn your attention to the screen. you cheer you on let you know you don't got to do life alone and let me tell you the family around you and your future self deserve the best version of you and so there's a table outside today yeah are we gonna clap about this or not like we got to figure this out <laughs> I love it it's a great crew it's a great group of individuals we have some professionals in that crew that are trained to help to help you really tell a better story and so Man, if you are looking for more information, there's a table outside, and if you don't want to stop by a table, you don't want to talk to anybody, it happens, it's all right. Thursday night, 6.30, feel free to show up. They'd love to see you. It's a great crew to help you take your next steps. We've been in a series called Verses over the past couple weeks, and we've been talking about those battles within us as we move towards mastering some of the disciplines and virtues that Jesus has called us to, like self-forgiveness and forgiveness, like being able to let go of the past, being able to be honest with ourselves. We've been doing some really deep work over the past few weeks. And today we're going to continue that conversation and we're going to present another virtue that I believe is going to change everything for you. But I believe before we dive into this virtue, it is right that we stop and go before God in a word of prayer. So would you join me in prayer, church? Father God, we are here in this place today believing that you're about to do something extraordinary. We are coming with the mindset that we are ready to be shifted in the right ways and the places that we need to go. We are ready to take that next step on the journey that you have for us. God, whether we're in here today full of anxiety, may you just give us breath. The ability to inhale your grace and exhale that stress. Inhale your peace and exhale all the frustrations, God. And as we listen to your word, may you remind us of your promises and your calling, not just now, but for the days to come. And we all lift this up in your son's holy name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. 
Boxer Muhammad Ali is heralded as one of the greatest boxers of all time. You see, he did a lot of good work in the ring, but outside of the ring, he had the gift of gab, and he had the hands to back it up. Maybe you've heard one of his phrases before, float like a butterfly, sting like a... That's right. It keeps going. It says, the hands can't hit. Let's see. I love it. I love all of it, man. He's, he's left a legacy. He was a legend. And so many MMA fighters and boxers and kickboxers have tried to emulate his gift of gab and his ability to be in the ring and floating and dancing and doing what he does best. He's iconic. Did you know he's so iconic? He actually fought the Man of Steel, Superman. Yeah, really. 1978 comic book came out, Superman versus Muhammad Ali. And I don't want to ruin the story, but I hear Muhammad Ali may have actually won that fight, which gives rise to this next story. See, Muhammad Ali was on an airplane, and as they were about to take off, the stewardess comes up to Muhammad Ali, and they're like, Mr. Ali, um, I noticed that your seatbelt isn't on. I would love if you could put your seatbelt on so we could take off and get in the air. I don't want to wait any longer. Could you please put your seatbelt on? And he looks at the stewardess, and he says, I'm Superman, and Superman don't need no seatbelt. So they roll out onto the tarmac, and as they're on the tarmac, they're about to take off. The engines are roaring. It's about to be a moment. They're about to travel. And so the stewardess notices. She does her thing. She comes back over. says, Mr. Ali, your seatbelt isn't on. Can I please have you please put your seatbelt on? And he says, didn't I not tell you? I am Superman. And Superman don't need no seatbelt. So they take off, and they're in the sky. And as they're in the sky, it hits my worst nightmare. Turbulence comes. Plane is shaking. The stewardess hobbles over, walks over on the seat, and says, Mr. Ali, there's turbulence. I need you to please put your seatbelt on. And he said, I'm Superman. Superman don't need no seatbelt. Fed up. She leans in and she says, well, frankly, sir, Superman don't need no airplane. (laughs) Today we're going to be talking about a virtue that is not a virtue you woke up and thought about. It's not a virtue that's going to get you plastered on any billboards. It's not a virtue that is going going to get you the most excited about life. But I believe it is a virtue that is going to unlock the greatness that is in you. It's a virtue that I believe is going to be the key to you not just having a moment of greatness, but living a life of greatness. A life that is marked by your family being well off. A life that is marked by you being secure in who you are, in your inner world and your outer world. A life marked by you being aware of where you are going. Greatness is in all of us. And I believe this virtue is going to help turn the dial and be that key to this, to greatness. But here's the thing. These two words often don't go together. I believe that when we choose to cultivate the virtue of humility, we will find greatness in every area of our life. We will experience and see God in ways that we never thought or could, thought or believed we could see God. We will see God heal our marriages. We will see more fruit and more success and more greatness in our careers. I believe humility is the key to us experiencing greatness in every area of our life. And now let me tell you, those aren't two words that go together often, are they? And I think the reason is, is because humility has an arch enemy. Superman had an arch enemy, and I know humility definitely has an arch enemy. And the arch enemy of humility is pride. You ever have an arch enemy before? Maybe like in elementary school you had an arch enemy. You looked at that person, you're like, ooh, we're going to war today. My blood is boiling. Just hear, breathe. Like, why are you breathing? Why are you chewing your cereal like that? Like that kind of arch enemy, like them being in the room and you're shifting the whole time. You're uncomfortable. You're like, I can't even, because the heat of their presence is just annoying me. Yeah, I had, I had a friend in elementary school. His name was Carlos. He wasn't really my friend. He was, uh, he was my enemy. And uh, Carlos, uh, man, Carlos, if you're watching at home, man, we got, we got some stuff to work out, bro. But Carlos was always around. 
Like, just always there, like, always next to me in class. We'd move up a grade. He's behind me in class. I'm always hearing him at the tables. He was always a little louder than me. And so, and I could spot Carlos's voice from a mile away. And guess what happened? My blood would boil, like, ooh, Carlos is here. <sighs> Carlos, man, right? And, and the thing is about Carlos is he was always, like, one point better than me. Like, in everything. Like, everything. Like, always one person picked before me. Always one point higher in a math test score, which wasn't really high. But, you know, still, he was always one point higher than me on anything that we did. And so when I think about Carlos, I just think, like, man, this dude was always around. Because arch enemies are just, like, always around. And just like that pride, just like Carlos, just like our boy Carlos today. Carlos, we need to talk. Um, just like Carlos, it is always around. You see, pride is in everything we do. It's going to be in your relationships. It's going to be in your future. It's going to be in your finances. It's going to be how you spend money. It's going to be in your marriages. It's going to be in your friendships. It's going to be in the way that you're driving your car. Pride is always around and it's always ready to rear its nasty head because it's in us. There's never a season in your life where you got to be like, okay, I don't got to deal with pride. And maybe today you're like, well, I don't struggle with pride. I'm the most humble person I know. <laughs> Today's message is for you because pride is always around and it is always in us. And just to be clear, we're not talking about, uh, about being a feeling proud because you can feel proud. I mean, you, some of us have, have kids that are just crushing it right now. Be, be proud of that. Some of you have stepped into new careers and gotten new jobs, and some of you are about to graduate college. Like, yo, be proud of that. That's natural. Today we are talking about when we are so full of ourselves that there is no room for anything else. We are talking about those moments that nothing else can factor into our equation. To put it in simple terms, we, pri having pride and, and being prideful is when we think of ourselves more highly then we ought. And man, isn't that the truth? I hate to tell you today, you're not Superman. Many of us operate as if we are Superman, but today we are not Superman and here, oh, Okay, pride is when we did that one great thing and then we equate it as everything we do is great. You know those moments? Pride is when we burn a bridge that we didn't have to. And we burned it because we didn't want to say sorry or we didn't want to have to explain to them. Or maybe we do go and we goof, come to them and go like, hey, I, I'm sorry, I messed up. But I did this because of you did this, 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 and this. And that's why I did this. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, I'm sorry. That's, that's pride. Or pride is when you can forgive and you don't because you want to watch them squirm. Don't act like you've never done that. You're like, they come to you, I'm so sorry, I messed up. And you're like, tell me more. <laughs> tell me more. Yeah, why, why did you mess up? Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So you're not going to do it right. That's, that right there is pride. Pride is when you talk to be heard and you don't listen to a word. Pride tells you you're Superman and you're not Superman. I hate to say it. We are not as in control as we think we are. But pride will convince ourselves of it because pride is a poison. And it's living in and it's living around each one of us. Proverbs 16.5, the writer puts it like this. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this. They will not go unpunished. He keeps going. Proverbs 16.18, pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. You ever hear the phrase, the pride comes before the fall? Yeah, because it's real. It's true. I mean, if there's any reason to be aware of the pride that is in our life, or even just to consider if there is pride in your life, it's because typically, if not eventually, that pride will lead, you, lead to you losing everything that you hold dear. Pride will crush the oxygen in your marriages. Pride will make you so uncoachable that you lose your career, your power, your position, and your influence. Pride will ruin your day. And the worst part is you're going to be the last person to know if you're full of pride. You ever go to a movie with somebody who's already watched the movie? And the whole time, instead of watching the movie, they're watching you watch the movie? 
I hate that. I do that all the time. I do it to my wife all the time. I'm like, yo, check out this part. Check out this part. Like, yo, this is coming up. It's about to happen, right? Oh, my God. Or you're watching them because you want to see if they like it or not. Oh, my gosh. It's so annoying, right? I do it. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, wife. I do it all the time. But that's kind of like what pride is. You have people watching from the sidelines of your life. And when something tragic happens and pride finally hits a wall and you lose everything, you'll be shocked. How did this happen to me? Nobody else is going to be shocked, though. Because they already know how this movie plays out. They've already experienced your pride and the destruction it's caused in their life where they've seen it in the lives around them because of our inability to listen, our inability to be coachable, our, our inability to not talk about ourselves. Pride is a dangerous poison. And if there's anything we realize today, unchecked pride will destroy any greatness that is brewing in your life. And if you're a follower of Jesus today, it will wreck any bridges God is building towards your future. If you want to experience greatness in your life, humility is the path of greatness. Humility will teach you and those around you that greatness is not defined in how much you say or how much you pretend to know but in the small moments of being human. But then why is it that it feels that the proud are always the ones that seem to have victory over the humble? Why does it, it feel like the arrogant and overconfident are, the, are always the ones in the position of power and influence, maybe even the power and influence that you crave for your life? Why is it that those who listen the least are in the positions of authority or put on a pedestal and paraded around as stories of success? I've been thinking about this question a lot this month because I didn't want to be on a stage telling you that humility was the path to greatness, even though I see it in the life of Jesus. And even though I, I, I've seen it be true in the lives around me, I, I couldn't tell you this because the reality is, is that in our worldview, we often parade pride as the path to greatness. And the difficulty with that is that it makes us believe that that is the right way and the best way forward. And as I've been thinking about this question a, a, a lot this month, here's what I've settled on. And here's what I've really come to believe after talking to many of you and talking to many successful people and great people in my life is that humility may be what sells, but it will not tell the story that you long for. It will not build the life that you long for. Pride will not build the life you long for. Humility may not sell, sell but it does tell the stories we long for and build a life worth living. Question, in a moment of crisis, who is it that you would want to draw near to? Is it somebody who wants to tell you about their experience immediately and how they've walked through the same exact thing and how they've been through it before and they understand everything that you're walking through? Or would you want to be near the humble who listens, who is attentive to your needs and not their needs? When it comes down to what you give your life to, the cause of your life, the purpose of your life, who are you more likely to follow, a manager who is self-motivated or a leader who desires for you to succeed in whatever that you do? Who are you, who are you more likely to bring your creative best out with? Who are you going to share your greatest ideas with? Who are you going to share your greatest self with? For me, I want to be around the humble in those moments when I'm trying to experience greatness. I want to be around those who listen, who are attentive, who are wise with me and aware of me because humility is a game changer. You see, what humility does is something that no other virtue does. It makes things that are difficult easier because you realize you don't got to be Superman. It actually heals things and not just causes a bigger rift. The reason it does that is because it listens and gets low and says, all right, I may not have all the answers. And when there is a gap, there is an ability to heal because of your humility. Humility cheers on. It says, yo, you keep doing what you do, 
And it's not because I don't value what I do. It's because I am so confident in who I am that I can look at you and celebrate. While pride is like, yo, look at me, look at me, look what I'm doing, yo, check this out. Humility's in the corner going, hey, you do your thing. Hey, all of you, you guys are crushing it. Great strength, great smile, great story to tell. I'm proud of you. You're doing great. Humility tells the stories that we crave. Pride sells, but it will not tell the stories that we desire. Patrick Lencioni, CEO of the Table Group, which helps leaders, uh, leaders who are Christian and non-Christian really help get the teams around their table that are helpful and moving the organizations forward that they, they believe uh, uh, that they're called to. Um, this is what he says about humility. Great team players lack excessive ego or concern about status. They are quick to point out the contributions of others and slow to seek attention for their own. They share credit, emphasize team over self, and define success collectively rather than individually. It is no great surprise then that humility is the single greatest and most indispensable attribute of being a team player. You want to be a good team player? You want to be great? Find humility. Humility is powerful for you and for the lives around you. But it's not something easily gained. We can't just wait for moments to be humble, right? Like imagine many of us didn't wake up going like, I need to be more humble today. It's time for me to embrace humility and be less proud. No, humility is difficult to find. I love what Proverbs 11 says. It says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, humiliation, but with humility, comes wisdom. Wisdom is awareness. It's proper perspective. It's being able to read the room. You ever been in a situation where somebody couldn't read the room? Like, the room, bro, it's not meant for this moment. That's one of my biggest fears. Because sometimes I'm a lot. And I know I'm a lot. And I'll go into a situation and I'll be a lot. And so sometimes I'll come into a room like, yeah, let's go. Come on, everybody. Yeah, let's have a good time. Whoa, yo, y'all are, are having a rough conversation, aren't you? Okay, okay, backing out of the room. Humi wisdom teaches us how to read the room, how to pull the levers of our life properly. See, it, knowledge tells us where to go. Wisdom tells us how to get there, who to bring, what to pack, all the snacks. It tells us all the good stuff. Wisdom comes from humility. But wisdom cannot be faked. Without wisdom, there'll be no greatness in your life. And fake it till you make it doesn't work. You can't fake your way into wisdom and you cannot fake your way into humility because eventually you will be found out. So how do we naturally and intentionally and authentically find humility? And I want to tell you the answer, but the reality is it's going to cause us to have to do some deep work. So here it is today. If you want to find humility in your life, if you want to unlock that greatness in your life, you have to go to war with pride. Because the reality is it's in each of us. But if you want to unlock that humility, you have to fight the pride in your life. Not just in one day, not just twice in your life, not just in Every single day, you need a battle plan to fight that pride that is going to emerge in your life when that good things happens. It's going to emerge in your life when those stressful moments come. That's going to emerge in your life when that person comes to you with an apology finally. That is the pride that we have to fight daily. You see, to battle pride is to cultivate humility. It's time that we put our pride in check. Put it in check. You ever put anybody in check before? You even know what that means? It's a slang term. I don't know if I'm allowed to teach you slang, but I'm going to teach you slang today, all right? So I'm going to tell you a little story. My, me and my little brother, uh, my brother's littler than me. Well, he was littler than me. He's 25 now, um, and he's gotten bigger than me. He's gotten stronger than me, and the thing is, he doesn't know it yet. You know why he doesn't know it? It's because I put him in check when we were little all the time. What putting in check means, you just put them in their place. I'm not saying I was the best brother. I wasn't a follower of Jesus. I, I, don't, don't hold it against me. But now, my little brother, he, he's bigger and stronger than me, but he doesn't know it. He doesn't know it because when he was little, I would just shove him for no reason. I would take his food and french fries. Why? Because I was the bigger brother. 
I was like, I'm going to put you in check. I'm going to put you in your place. You are going to know I am the bigger brother. It is time that we put our pride in check. Because that unchecked pride is going to lead to destruction, and you don't even know it yet, but the other people around you do. It is time that we go to the carpet and go, I, God, I have this stuff in me, I have this toxin in me, and I want to begin to get it out. I want to be able to put it to the side. I want to be able to eradicate it from my life. Because there can be no room for pride if you want to experience greatness. There can be no room for ego, amigo. You get what I'm saying? There can be no room for that if we want to move forward with the life that God is calling us to live. Because you have a great life that is in you. And you may not believe it today, but let me tell you, we have a God who believes in it. There is a story beyond this broken moment that you're in. There is a story that God is wanting. And all we have to do is find humility, and that's going to start by us going to war with this thing that comes up called pride. It's time to take down our arch enemy. Can we do that today, church? Let's do that. In Philippians chapter 2, yeah. In Philippians chapter 2, I love it. Paul, who is one of the early followers of Jesus, he wrote letters to churches all throughout the Mediterranean world, helped start these small communities of people who were meeting Jesus and encountering hope for the very first time. See, this Paul, I love him because he would often write letters and he would like nicely, like very, very thoughtfully check these churches. So how he would do that is he would like give them some knowledge, some wisdom, but also let them know like, hey, I know what's going on in your church right now, heads up. It's probably going to lead to some bad stuff if you're not staying on track with what God's calling you to do. And so that's Paul. And so in Philippians, he's writing to the church of Philippi, one of his favorite churches. One of the churches that he believed in so much. He believed in all the churches, but he really believed in this church. He believed in He believed in what they were capable of, what they were doing in the area, the region that they were doing it in. And he gives them some direction. And I love what he shares with them today. So Philippians chapter 2, this is where we're going to be spending most of our time. Let's check it out. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the spirit, any tenderness, any compassion, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Come on. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Humility is meant to define the church community. Putting others above ourselves is meant to define the community of God. Why is it so scary then? It's so scary because what if the other person doesn't do it? What if I'm humble and nobody notices what if I'm humble and they're not humble and they take advantage of me? That's a real fear. And so Paul is saying, like, just, you just need to see that this is, this is the portrait of what we're going to do. If you have any common sharing in the spirit, if you believe in Jesus, if Jesus has given you any love, if you have found any hope at all, even an ounce of hope, make my joy complete by being the community that Jesus intended us to be. Why did he intend for us to be that? Because our actions... Our thoughts, our language, our posture, they have an impact on the lives around us. And we have to be wise, we have to be aware of each other. But it begins by us being aware of ourselves. That all of our stuff we do has a dotted line right back to people's hearts and ultimately back to their futures. He says, like, if, if me saying it isn't enough, let me give you a portrait of why. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. The same mindset as Christ Jesus. This is about mindset. Your mindset about things will impact your reality. This is not just about imitation. What would Jesus do? That's great. This is also about your mindset. What mindset do you have about the relationships around you? Pride check moment. What, what mindset do you have about the people in your life? What are they there for? Are they there to fulfill you? Are they there to elevate you, to agree with you, to, to put you on a pedestal? Are they there to be in competition to you? Do you see everybody as a competition? That's what pride does. It makes everybody a competition. But humility makes everybody a partner. A partner you can do life with, figure this out with, ask questions with, figure it out 
together. We have to be aware of what is our mindset. Is your mindset at all full of pride? He continues, who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Can we just sit in the gravity of what Paul just said in this moment? This is the mindset we're meant to have with each other, the same mindset of Jesus. Jesus who did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, did not consider his position and his influence and his power, did not consider that to be used to his own advantage. Pride check, where do you need to power down? Where have you used your position and power, your influence to gain in areas you didn't need to gain? A title maybe was thrown out. An expectation that wasn't earned or wasn't expressed. Maybe a situation that came up. And maybe we ought to get low. Maybe it's a moment you've held your status. A status that was given to you that maybe you didn't earn. And you've used that status to keep people distant. Jesus powered down because he wanted to get close and personal. Power down and you don't take advantage of the status that you have, what happens is you're able to get close and personal. You're able to empathize with the lives around you. Is there an area of your life you need to just power down and get close and personal? Paul keeps going. Rather, he, Jesus, made himself nothing translated, poured out himself, took that power, influence, and authority and dumped it out like a cup by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human life found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus marks a point in human history that is forever changed. He came in a time period where authority and power were associated with spirituality. The Roman emperor at that time would consider himself God-like and have holidays dedicated to him where people would bring sacrifices and tributes because they wanted to honor the emperor because of his position and power in Rome. Jesus came in a time period in an ecosystem that literally associated your proximity with God with what you had and what you did. He came in a time period where Sadducees and Pharisees and Zealots all vied and fought for power. And the people who had the most power in the Jewish world were the people who were the closest to God. This is when Jesus came in to human reality. This is in the time period that Jesus would radically change our perception of what it means to know God and experience God and to go to God and what it means to lead and be great. And he would do so by becoming the very nature of a servant. God would take the nature of a servant. And it's not because he didn't have the power. It's not because he wasn't wise and all-knowing. It's because he was humble. He held that power and did not take advantage of that power. Rather, he emptied himself so he can be like us and know us and empathize with us and be close with us and serve us. If there's anything you take away from today, it's that God's primary character is that of a servant. We often don't associate with God in service, do we? We don't even associate greatness and service together. And then God and service together put in the same sentence. It just doesn't compute because what do you associate God with? Often power, authority. Maybe today it's your first time coming into church and you heard some karaoke on, st- on screen and you're like, this is cool, right? Now we're talking on stage. And you're just like, what is this whole thing about? Because I've expected God to be God of domineering and expectations. I know a lot of people who love, uh, I talk to God, I, I talk with people a lot about God, it's just it's part of the job, right? And so like, there, there's a, so many people in my life who love Jesus, who get Jesus, but they have the biggest problems with God. And it's because of their expectation of God, of God wanting it all. God seeing you, but wanting it all still and not. But this is what it tells us, it breaks that model of it. It says, no, God is here to serve. And his power makes the most sense When he serves, he takes his power and authority and he doesn't leverage it. He uses it for us. 
He says, I'm gonna humble myself to death, to even death on a cross, which is one of the lowest forms of execution in the Roman world. He says, I'm gonna do that in order to trade your life, your broken life, your high expectations, that prideful thing that you have that constantly keeps you distant from people and keeps you from healing because you're afraid to say, I'm sorry. I'm gonna take those things and I'm gonna trade it. I'm gonna trade it for my perfect life. That is the call of Jesus. And I'm gonna give you more life in doing so. Jesus is a servant and he craves to serve you. Have you let him serve you lately? Have you come to him with your your pains and your frustrations? Maybe today you're not struggling with pride, you're struggling with self-deprecation. And you think that's what humility is. See, humility isn't thinking of yourself low at all. It's owning who you are and being confident in that. And maybe today is not a day where you feel like pride is the enemy, but it's self-deprecation is the enemy. You see, self-deprecation is a form of pride because it says that you know best. And a God, when there's a God who is telling you, I want to give you life and you have a life and you can fix that marriage. And there's a better story to tell on the other side of this drama. And you are a good mom. Stop looking at Pinterest. Like you're good. In that kind of environment, Jesus is saying, let me carry your burden Matthew 11 says he is gentle and humble in heart and he wants to give you rest because that's what a servant does. It helps alleviate the load. It takes pressure off of your back and that is what Jesus wants to do with you today. He wants to take those expectations that you've put on yourself. Some people are so worried like I can't live up to God's standards. We can't even live up to our own standards. See, Jesus is saying, let me carry that with you and for you. Let's begin to heal bridges that were burned. Let's begin to tell better stories together. Come to me in humility, because you don't have to be Superman in every area of your life. You just gotta be you. You gotta be you. And you come to God in all earnesty, God, I don't know what to do. And just see what happens And all Jesus asks is, do this with each other. Like literally, just do this with each other. Like help other people see my goodness and my greatness by the way that you love each other, by the way you serve one another, by the way you carry each other's burdens, by the way that you help each other over rough situations. Pride check moment is serving beneath you. Is there anything beneath you? Is there a role beneath you? A people group beneath you? Is there friendships that are beneath you? Are there situations that are beneath you? Are there tasks that are beneath you? Jesus was willing to serve, and this is what radically changed the world because he had all power and all knowledge and all wisdom, and he chose to serve with it. We betray ourselves when we want God's promises and powers, but we do not want his character. His character is that of a servant. Power and knowledge without humility is vanity. And vanity is pr- When we serve, we find greatness. When we serve those around you, the world experiences greatness. We elevate one another. How do you need to serve somebody this week? Come on. And Paul finishes the passage with this, with this beautiful declaration of Jesus who poured out himself in the aftermath of it all, after the aftermath of the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the declaration of Paul that if you want to find greatness, you find the mindset of Jesus. And when you find the mindset of Jesus, you will find humility. God chooses and exalts and lifts up the humble and moves them towards greatness. If you want a life after God, humility is not an option. Going to war with your pride is not an option. It is the best way forward. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Under God's mighty hand. It's mighty because it knows the way forward and in due time because this is a process, people. This isn't going to happen in one moment. This is us constantly going to war and saying, Pride, you don't belong there. 
yo, I got this phone call and the person yelled at me on the other end and man, I'm about to pop off right now, God. I need more of you and less of me in this moment. Every single day, yo, somebody just cut me off on the freeway. Jesus, help me. I'm not gonna lose it. I'm at odds with my kids and my spouse. All right, I'm gonna get low and I'm gonna try seeing things from their perspective, even though I am M-O-M. I am gonna get honest with myself and those around me because I want to experience the greatness of God in everything. And I know you do too. And so it's time that we humble our and we consider what he wants to do as he serves and loves and calls us. So just to make sense of everything, humility is the noble choice to forego your status, deploy your resources, and use your influence for the good of others before yourself. Forego your status. Jesus emptied himself and he took all of his power and his position and he did not hold it in the light of God. He says, no, I'm gonna care for you and I'm gonna hold you up. Will you just let go? We just let go of the Superman complex. We just let go of all the things that you expect of yourself and let me be a part of your life. On December 4th, we have Baptism Sunday and that's one of the best expressions, I think. One of the best portraits of foregoing ourselves of just letting it go, putting it to the side. It's not saying it's not there. It's just saying, I'm gonna put this to the side right now and I'm gonna get eye to eye with the I need to be eye to eye with because there's nothing above me and there's nothing beneath me. Maybe you need to get eye to eye with God again. It's time for him to, you to let him serve you. It's time for you to go, I got my junk and my mess and my brokenness and my grossness. I, I just need help. I need help with these false expectations I've put on myself or maybe even the expectation somebody else put on me that I'm not even necessarily wrestling with properly. I need help with that. Baptism is that portrait. I'm gonna die to my old self and I'm gonna get that new life that I didn't even know God had for me. I'm gonna step in saying, God, I'm out of control. I am giving you control. I'm gonna go underneath the water. I'm gonna come out of that water just celebrating that I may not have it all together, but I know that you got me. I may not have it all right, but you're, you're calling me and you're carrying me and I'm gonna live in that mindset and my, that belief that you are calling pride out of me and you're calling me into greatness. It's time for some of us to forego our status, to drop the titles, drop the expectations and get eye to eye with people. Maybe that comes in a form of an apology today. And I've noticed that prideful people, people often have burned all their bridges already. Maybe it's time for you to go to somebody and, and really begin that conversation of, I don't want this in me anymore. There's nothing wrong with that. There's only a better story to be told from that. Deploy your resources. You have strengths and gifts and ability that are untapped. I'm not just talking about your physical stuff, but I am saying that there is something inside of you that needs to be used for others. There's a gifting. There's a way, a gift of gab maybe. There's an ability to see and know people. There's an ability to cheer on people. There's an ability just to help them well when people are scatterbrained like myself. There is something inside of you that needs to get out of you. It's time for you to deploy your resources. Jesus deployed his resources. He used all of his position and power and went to the cross and traded his life for ours. How can you deploy what you have? One of the favorite things I love hearing is when people come to me and I don't even know who they are and they're like, I've been watching at home and I started a connection group here uh, uh, because I just want to get people together from, from the church and just talk about the message and process what God's doing in my life. And I'm like, whoa, what is your name? That is awesome. That's deploying your resources, not waiting for permission and just being the people of God wherever you're at. See, the people of God is not the pastor or the building. We've said that hundreds of times, especially through a COVID, through, through COVID and the pandemic. We've said that and we have meant that. Now it's time for you to deploy your strengths and use them for the benefit of others. And maybe today you're like, I don't have, I don't have any strengths. It's time for you to sit down with somebody that you love, that knows you, and let them in all authenticity just pour love into you. Just who you are and what you meant to them. Maybe today you need to go before God and do that. Maybe on Baptism Sunday, you need to go before God for the very first time and go like, God, I, I need you to be the leader of my life. And finally, influence those around you. There's somebody in your life who needs you. They don't need you to be anything but you. Would you consider just letting it all be dropped today 
just for the sake of helping somebody else take that next step forward. Maybe that is just through processing. Maybe that is through an invitation to know God. Maybe that is an invitation to come and experience what God is doing here. But let me tell you, your influence is greater than you think. Somebody in your life just needs you to believe in them today. And it could radically change everything. Myself and many of my friends are in positions we are today because somebody believed in us. Somebody needs you to believe in them today. Use that influence. Send that text. Show that love. And really, let's be the people God has called us to be. In all humility, let's go before him and let him take this junk and make it beautiful and tell a better story. It's time, church, that we don't let pride get in the way because there's no more room for it. It's time. That pride goes and humility rises because with humility we will experience the stories that God has always intended for our life. In just a moment, the worship team is going to come out. I want to invite you. Let's just worship in humility, going before God, saying, God, I'm not Superman. I need you. I need you to carry me. I need you to take me. I need you to hold me. I need you to deal with some of the stuff inside of me. It takes courage. But let's worship in courage together, church. Let's pray together. Father God. May we come to you before, may we come before you, God, in, in all honesty and authenticity that we don't have it all together and we don't want to have it all together. We just want to come before you knowing that you care, that you love us, that you see us, that you notice us, that you want us. And that's everything. God, may you fill us with humility. May you call out the pride. May you stamp out its roots. And may you remind us that you're not done yet. We all lift this up in your son's holy name. And all God's people said, amen. Death had claimed its victory. The king of love had given up his life. The darkest day in history. There on a cross they made for sinners. For every curse is blood atoned. the earth began to shake and the veil was what sacrifice was made as a heaven's
online. If it's your first time, please see us at Guest Central and have a great holiday this week. Bye. God bless.